In this video, we're going to talk about some of the most important gram-negative pathogens. These are the enterobacteria. There's a few different names for them. You'll see in the, the image on the right, they're called the enterobacteriaceae. That's the formal Latin name for this family. Um, more commonly, they're called either enterobacteria or even just enterics. <clears throat> so what we're going to do in this first slide is just introduce the enterics. And we'll talk about the first of three major divisions within the enterics, and actually the first two, the coliforms and the non-coliforms. In a separate video, we'll talk about the, uh, the true pathogenic enterics, the ones that uh, cause disease pretty much all the time when they're in us. There are no, no beneficial associations. If you look at the little pie chart at the very top, what you see is uh, a look at all of the bacteria that cause nosocomial infections, hospital-acquired infections. Nosocomial bacterial infections tend to be some of the worst, some of the most important, and they're the ones that we're often watching the closest because um, they're getting into wounds, they're getting into um, privileged spaces that don't have any normal flora, so they're extremely vulnerable. And in many cases, the, the patient is already particularly vulnerable if they've been hospitalized. What you see up there is that <clears throat> just slightly over half of all of the, um, all of the uh, nosocomial infections are caused by gram negatives. That's the pink on the right. Slightly under half uh, are caused by gram positives, and there's a small slice that are caused by yeast, and that's gonna be primarily candida. Now, the larger pie that you see under it is the slice of the gram negatives, or slightly over 50%. And what you notice is that in the darkish pink, going from, uh, let's say, noon to about, what is that, about five o'clock there, where it points to salmonella, just under 50% of all of these nosocomial infections, and by far the vast majority of all gram-negative infections, fall into this family of the enterobacteria. It's a, it's a very important group, and among the gram-negatives, probably the most important group. You notice the biggest slice, then, is the, the coliforms in the enterobacteria. Coliforms are going to be almost exclusively E. coli, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> After that, we've got Klebsiella, Serratia, Enterobacter, Citrobacter. These are the coliforms. You'll define that shortly. And then there's a couple non-coliforms listed here, Proteus and Salmonella. Proteus tends to fall into the non-coliform category. Salmonella falls into the true pathogen category. And you can see Pseudomonas off to the side there. Pseudomonas infections make up the other huge group, the other big slice of the uh, gram-negative pie besides the enterobacteria. Pseudomonas are, in fact, gram-negatives. They're somewhat related to the enterobacteria in, in terms of their phylum and subphylum, um, but they are not directly related, and we don't consider those to be enterics. So let's look at some, uh, some genuses, genera, of enterobacteria that are medically important. <clears throat> I'm going to read through this list for pronunciation's sake, but I want you to get familiar with this. Escherichia, you know that in terms of E. coli, that is the E. coli's first name, right? It's the E in E. coli. Salmonella. Klebsiella, Shigella. Those first four are arguably the most important in terms of just sheer abundance of, uh, of gram-negative infections. After that, we've got Proteus, Enterobacter, Serratia, Yersinia. We'll talk about that one a little later. Citrobacter behaves very much like E. coli. Morganella, Providencia, Hafnia, and Edwardsiella. And those last four over on the right are far less common. So they're medically important because they do cause some infections, and clinically you will eventually see them in your careers, um, but they're not the most common ones. The first four on the left and that whole list on the left are the ones you're likely to see most often, and uh, the ones that uh, well, I want you to, to get familiar with all of these names, both pronunciation and spelling. Let's get some definitions down then. The enterobacteria, the enterics. Uh, these are the Enterobacteriaceae. These are bacteria that fall into that broad family designation of Enterobacteriaceae. So those terms, Enterobacteria and Enteric, are essentially equivalent to Enterobacteriaceae. Three ways we typically group them. Coliforms, non-coliforms, and true pathogens. Coliforms are defined as the Enterobacteria that are opportunistic, so they're not... Um, professional pathogens. They're not always causing disease. They can be part of our commensal or mutualistic flora, but they are in fact opportunistic pathogens, and they can ferment lactose. That's a defining feature about them, coliform. Coliform means coli-like, as in similar to E. coli. Non-coliforms are also opportunistic, not professional, not true pathogens, but they don't ferment lactose. 
So we've got our opportunistic pathogens, the coliforms and non-coliforms, and we've just distinguished them from one another based on their metabolism of lactose. It makes for a very quick and easy uh, overnight test in the laboratory. And then we have a set that we call true pathogens. These are professionals. These don't mess around. You don't have um, salmonella, for example, living in your gut mutualistically or commensally. Uh, if they're there living in your gut, they're either trying to cause an infection or they're successful at causing an infection. So these are the three groups we're going to look at. And in this video, we're going to look at the coliforms and non-coliforms, and then we'll do a separate video for the true pathogens. Here are some features of the coliforms. Okay, these are aerobic or facultatively anaerobic. <clears throat> they are, in fact, lactose fermenters, and they produce both acid and gas. Gram-negative rods, of course, that's the whole group of enterobacteria that we're looking at. Uh, they can be found in the intestinal tracts of humans and animals, and we call those fecal coliforms. They can also be found elsewhere in the environment, like soil, on the surface of plants, in detritus, which means dead and decaying plant and animal matter. We would call those non-fecal coliforms. And the most common genera that we find are Escherichia, and that would be a fecal coliform, and that is the sort of uh, type strain, if you will, of the fecal coliforms. And we know that even though that's only one genus, there are literally hundreds of strains of, of Escherichia known, particularly E. coli. And then we've got three important non-fecal coliforms, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Citrobacter, that uh, aren't likely living in our gut, but if they do get in there, they can uh, cause some infections. Um, and they can cause trouble, and they are genetically related to Escherichia, and so they, they fall together in that group. Um, you've used the entero tubes. Uh, I think we now call them enteropluri. You've used the API 20E test strips. Those are used, if you recall, for distinguishing the different features of genera within the family enterobacteria. Gastroenteritis is the primary type of infection that we see with, uh, with the coliforms, in particular the, the, uh, the fecal coliforms like E. coli. Um, there are some other infections such as uh, sepsis in the blood and urinary tract infections, but gastroenteritis is probably the most important. <clears throat> um, these are common human or animal commensals, meaning they're living there. Uh, commensal might not even be a good term. They're really mutualists because they are providing some pretty good benefits. If you don't remember some of the E. coli benefits to our gut uh, and our overall health, go back and, and study some of that, see if you can remember. Uh, I, I put 1% on this slide. Not that they're in 1% of the human population, but about 1% of all the bacteria in our gut, roughly, are in fact E. coli. It's a relatively small number, but they play a pretty big role. I said that there are hundreds of serotypes known. Serotype is a, a clinical term for different strains. Right? There, there are hundreds, possibly pushing 1,000 known different serotypes or strains of E. coli, each with their own level of virulence, their own list off the menu of virulence factors that they can you know, pull out as tricks to cause disease and so on. Three of the most common diseases are going to be urinary tract infections, neonatal meningitis, and gastroenteritis. And of course, the gastroenteritis is what we're going to focus on here as our example. They have a lot of different virulence determinants. And again, not every strain will have every one of these. But these are some examples of some of the things we see in the pathogenic E. coli strains. There are adhesins, proteins that allow them to adhere. They have invasins, proteins that allow them to invade more deeply into our tissues. They have toxins. There are several different categories of toxins and lots of different toxins that show up with different E. coli infections. And some of them have antiphagocytic determinants. Think through those categories and put them in the context of what we talked about when we talked about virulence factors. And uh, make sure you understand how each of these allows some strains of E. coli to cause disease. <clears throat> now clinically, we've got four different classes that we often talk about that can cause gastroenteritis. And you'll see these abbreviations. Even the, the newspapers will pick up on these sometimes. ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli. EIEC, enteroinvasive E. coli. Uh, E-H-E-C, but I prefer to call it E-H-E-C because it sounds like you're cussing like in Christian language. Okay, what the E-H-E-C? Enterohemorrhagic E. coli and E-P-E-C, enteropathogenic. And I've even heard they've added a couple more to this list, but these four terms are relatively common, and it's important to understand some of the similarities and differences between these different four. So let's look at E-T-E-C, or enterotoxigenic E. coli. They, they depend very heavily on their enterotoxins, toxins that attack the intestinal lining, they produce both a heat labile enterotoxin called LT, 
and that labile means it falls apart easily, right? So when it gets heated, it falls apart and it's no longer stable, no longer functional. But many of them also produce heat-stable enterotoxins called ST. They can even resist boiling for half an hour. Those heat-stable enterotoxins are the biggest threat because if food, for example, has been handled improperly um, prior to cooking, cooking will kill off any LT toxins, but any ST toxins are going to stick around and make you really sick. ETEC are, are non-invasive. They're not boring into our tissues in any way. Uh, they're attempting to grow a little bit, but more than anything, they're producing toxins uh, in order to, uh, to get as much nutrients out of your intestinal tract as they possibly can. Many of these are mild. There are some examples of severe ETEC infections. Many are mild and relatively short-lived. And one of the ways that we can tell we've got an ETEC infection from some of the others is that you're going to have diarrhea without any fever. So pay attention to some of these details as your patients are giving you histories. That patient history can make such a big difference in helping you to narrow down what possible pathogens are causing these illnesses. Diarrhea without fever is, uh, is signature for enterotoxigenic E. coli. This is the most common traveler's diarrhea. Every now and then we'll have a waterborne outbreak. And you can see that ID50 value. ID50 means infectious dose that 50% of the time is sufficient to cause disease. In other words, how many cells does it take to get a dose that's going to be able to overcome your immune system? You know, the ID50 value is 100 million cells. So to get traveler's diarrhea, you really do have to consume a pretty large slug of enterotoxigenic E. coli before it's going to be able to cause any disease. Enteroinvasive E. coli, as the name implies, is highly invasive. It penetrates the uh, gastrointestinal epithelial tissue and then multiplies inside that epithelial layer. There are no enterotoxins involved, unlike the enterotoxigenic E. coli. Um, these are clinically identical to Shigella, um, a Shigella dysentery, or what's sometimes called bacillary dysentery. We'll talk about that on the next uh, video. It causes fever, cramps, diarrhea, bloody stool. Almost, almost impossible to distinguish an enteroinvasive E. coli from a Shigella dysenteri infection. Uh, the only known reservoirs for enteroinvasive E. coli are infected humans. It doesn't mean it's the only ones that exist. As far as we can tell, people aren't picking it up from animals, from water, from food. They're getting it person to person. And you notice that ID50 value. It went down 100-fold. We're talking only a million cells now. Now, a million cells might sound like a lot, but it's, it's only 1% of what's required for an ETEC infection to get established. These are highly virulent organisms, highly contagious organisms. EPEC, enteropathogenic E. coli, watery bloody diarrhea. That sounds nice. Um, it can contaminate drinking water, certain meats. In developing countries, this is one of the main causes of diarrhea. If you don't remember what the number one cause of diarrhea is in children in developing countries, go back to our, our section on viruses and remind yourself what it is. Again, no ST or LT enterotoxins involved. It's just invasiveness, and not nearly as invasive as the EIEC strains we just talked about, but moderately invasive, and roughly the same ID50 value. Sometimes uh, these EPEC strains are involved in traveler's diarrhea, uh, though not as, not as common as the ETEC strains that we first began with. Uh, EHEC, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, so the intestinal tract hemorrhaging. E. coli 0157H7 is the most common serotype that causes serious, serious infection, can kill patients. 0157H7 sounds like gobbledygook, but it, it should become a word in your mind. You should get comfortable with this. Hemorrhagic colitis is bloody diarrhea. Um, uh, EHEC strains are the most common cause of severe hemorrhagic colitis. Uh, if left untreated, it can cause uh, a much more serious disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome. And if people are going to die from an EHEC infection, it's usually from HUS. Um, I'd recommend what you do is, is pull up the internet and uh, look up what HUS is all about so you can see how it ties in with a, an EHEC infection. One of the more important toxins that are produced by EHEC strains is something we call a Shiga-like toxin. It's a protein synthesis inhibitors, inhibitor, pardon me, and it actually attaches to the surface of, of our white blood cells, specifically neutrophils, and gets distributed very rapidly throughout uh, and inhibits proteins in the process. Look at that low ID50 value from 10 to 100 cells based on 0157H7. 10 to 100 cells. That is a very, very low ID50 value. I mean, you barely come into any contact with this organism and you're going to get sick. Has some moderate invasiveness, 
elicits it's an intense inflammatory response. And here's an interesting point to make a note of. Antibiotics can make it worse. Antibiotics can make the infection worse. Make a note of that. If you've got a patient that's got an E. coli infection and you were, you were gambling it was something different, maybe you thought it was an Apex strain, and you put them on, uh, let's say, uh, you know, seven-day course of amoxicillin, and within five days they're coming back saying, man, I'm so much worse off. You're still convinced it's E. coli because the lab told you it's E. coli. It may be an EHEC strain, uh, such as 0157H7, and uh, its response to antibiotics is actually to dig in its heels and make things worse off for your patient. Worth paying attention to, to your patient history and then the progress of the disease uh, once you get to working with your patient. All right, so that's the end of what I'm going to talk about with regard to the coliforms. Um, the coliforms are primarily E. coli strains. They're not entirely. There are a few strains, few genera that we call non-coliform enterobacteria. Um, I'm just going to look at Proteus as an example. It is an opportunistic enteric pathogen. Um, it does not um, ferment lactose, and so it doesn't fit in with the first group of, uh, of coliforms. After E. coli, Proteus is the second most common cause of urinary tract infection. It is naturally resistant to many antibiotics, and so it can be tough to fight. And part of its pathogenesis that makes it real important is that it produces urease. Now, you, you looked at urease in the lab. If you remember, urease is an enzyme that lets bacteria like Proteus uh, consume urea carbamate, this molecule here in the bottom right. And when it does that, it releases ammonia. By releasing ammonia, it increases the pH and it causes some precipitation. And that's how we can end up with urinary tract stones, things like kidney stones. There are a couple other infections, um, particularly of the, the liver and, um, and of the stomach lining that can include urease as part of the pathogenesis. Those, those are bacteria, not proteus, in fact, not enterobacteria. So urease is not limited to proteus, but proteus does take advantage of urease, and because of that is able to, uh, to cause some pretty good, uh, pretty good in, uh, uh, urinary tract infections. I'm going to stop this video here, so I want you to go through it a few more times, make sure it jives with your notes, look up any terms or ideas that, that you didn't catch um, back on the Internet, and then uh, take a look at the next video because the next video will be on the true path.